EDI and EDI transactions. EDI stands for electronic data interchange and uh, it is an essential uh, formats and standards required for two businesses or multiple businesses to transact business in e-commerce. To this avoids having to uh, key in various data again and again. So whenever say for instance a purchase order comes, if it is in standard EDA format, it can be interpreted uh, automatically. And um, the, the actual data, namely the purchase order, the, uh, uh, the actual acceptance of the order, the um, dispatch or delivery note and so on, all them, all of them had to be sent through a network connecting the two businesses. As I pointed out, these networks can be either a private network, that means there is a dedicated line between the two, or it can be a public network, uh, that is internet infrastructure uh, using the public switch telephone network, or there is something called value added networks, which are actually maintained by service providers which are semi-private. In other words, the value added networks are uh, essentially provided so that it is not open to the public. It is open to only a certain number of limited companies. So security is definitely better than internet, but you cannot have absolute security, but then they do ensure some encryption and so on and uh, separate out the uh, various companies uh, in the within that van. So each one is separately encrypted and the possibility of one being able to read the others uh, data and so on is uh, not there. A recent uh, introduction which is, a, which is which runs on the internet but does provide more security than the internet is called a virtual private network. A virtual private network is something which um, is not a private network like a dedicated line, but uh, it gives you higher security than the internet, primarily by using encryption and so called security services in the uh, uh, which are provided by the internet protocol. Okay. So, I will not get into the details of the uh, virtual private networks because you will actually learn about them in your network course, but it is sufficient for me to say that the, um, uh, the macronym which is used is uh, SSL VPN, that is secure socket layer in the, in the uh, IP traffic, internet traffic a virtual private network. So they call it SSL VPN and SSL VPN is provided by many vendors like Cisco uh, which is a vendor of uh, routers and so on also provide, they also buy some of the ISPs like for instance in India, SIFI uh, provides an SSL VPN service for clients which uh, does provide higher security levels because SSL VPN effectively uh, you might say reserves or tunnels through the internet in a certain path uh, which is kept secure and which is not easily uh, you might say intruded by the uh, hackers and so on. So it provides a bet definitely better security than the internet. So the question which a company has to decide is what do they want to follow? Do we want to have a private network, dedicated network which is very, very expensive or they want to use a value added networks or the VPN. Today uh, the trend is towards VPN because it is uh, cheaper than uh, a dedicated line, it is also cheaper than the value added networks. In fact, value added networks, there are not too many of them 
now existing in our in our country. I mean, it used to be provided by uh, large companies like IBM and so on. So, primarily all these come because it is important to ensure reliable, guaranteed and secure electronic documents uh, by the intended receiver from a sender. The value added networks normally provide post boxes for all their subscribers. In other words, the value added network is a, a private network. And uh, it, but then as I said, shared private network. And it guarantees delivery. It is open 24 by 7 and provides security acknowledgement, audit trace, who did what, at what time and so on. And no repudiation is possible by users because third party is actually keeping an audit trail. Some uh, brands also provide the conversion from the electronic data interchange format to the application format which a company may, may use uh, uh, earlier. So that they still are there, in other words, the translation from the standard EDI to the internal, internal uh, structure is a service they provide which allows you without having to disturb your current method of uh, uh, working with documents to still adhere to the EDI standard. So this is the disadvantage compared to using a say an SSL VPN or the internet is um, the cost is high. And um, so it is used only by large businesses and not by smaller businesses. So to use the internet with, with EDI, as I pointed out, XML is becoming a better standard because XML along with the document type definition publicized by the, uh, the various uh, participants in e-commerce provides a way of essentially having a method of communicating because you can have an um, uh, agreed upon format and both parties can use XML and use the same format. And of course, it is better to kind of adhere to EDI like format because that is universally used by many, many companies. But you can still adapt EDI uh, and use XML um, as, a, uh, as a method of communication on the uh, internet okay, or uh, 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 VPNs. And um, along with XML, one uses what, what is known as a multipurpose internet mail extension to attach EDI forms to email messages. This part of the internet infrastructure. And uh, it is called a simple, uh, uh, you, you know, you can use a simple mail transfer protocol of the internet to transmit this these documents. If uh, secure transmission is needed, something called security enhanced MIME. Uh, is used, which is encryption and digital signature. And I will talk about encryption and digital signature at greater length later on. Um, and uh, a very long documents, or many documents that we send together, you are sending it as email, I may bunch them all together and send, send using an FP, FTP or a file transfer protocol, again that of internet. And again, you know, just to repeat, we standard EDI defines several hundred transactions, defines data segments, corresponding groups of data elements, and uh, defines data elements with individual fields such as price, quantity, etc. This is just to uh, reiterate the fact that the <coughs> it is necessary to have an EDI standard document format to facilitate the uh, interpretation of documents and uh, to facilitate the working of uh, many different companies together. Okay. Now, as I pointed out, if you use internet, and even if you use a public, in other words, particularly if you use a public such tele telephone network, it becomes extremely important to ensure security. Okay. Uh, if you say pure private network, even then, that private network uh, uh, one would expect nobody can intrude. But some, even there, certain amount of 
security concerns are necessary okay and uh, one should be aware of it even though the level of uh, awareness may not be as uh, much as a level of awareness for the internet but of course as i pointed out again the private uh, interconnection is becoming more and more rare because of its expense and most companies are really going towards the uh, using the internet uh, as a public infrastructure because a lot of work has gone on in security to be enable companies to work together on the internet without compromising on security. So, primarily in succeeding a part of a part of part of a lecture and maybe part of the next lecture, I will be concerned about how to ensure security for electronic transactions carried out over the internet. So, we assume that the infrastructure is internet, we assume that transactions are carried out between multiple parties and we would like to see how to ensure security. So, as I because internet is insecure and eavesdropping is possible by excuse me possible by uh, intruders and so on, it is uh, necessary to protect company confidential information from snoopers that is uh, hackers, people who get into the system and so on. So, we also need to protect a company's network from unauthorized entry. Okay. But if you if the company's internet intranet is connected to the internet, in theory every computer in the organization becomes accessible to an outsider through the internet using the IP address of all the individuals in the company. This can be very dangerous because several people may work on confidential information and you do not want to allow uh, unauthorized um, hacking of, uh, of confidential information which may be used by different people in the organization. So, it is very necessary to make sure that the, the company's internet is protected in some sense or insulated from hackers, from other intruders who may come on the internet. Now, there are uh, two methods which many companies use. One method which many companies use which I know is that they have a private internet within the company which is highly secure which is not connected to the internet at all. So, in other words it is completely isolated or insulated from the internet and there are only a few machines which interact with the outside world and those machines only transact business between companies and so one cannot get into the local internet. There is of course complete physical separation of the company's internet where confidential work is going on and then of course you cannot be isolated you cannot be removed at all completely from the external world. So, the some machines are connected to the internet that is one way. The other way is to use certain kind of machines at the boundary they are called firewalls to prevent entry by outsiders into the internet. So, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, this, these issues. So, when an organization receives a message, it has to be sure from whom the message has come and whether the mes message is authentic and has not been changed by an authorized person. So, we need a also something called a digital signature which can be used in a court of law. Let, it, let me explain a little bit what, what I mean by this. When you get a purchase order from uh, somebody, say from, from a company, normally in the manual system, the purchase order is a print is kind of typed or printed and at the bottom there is a signature of the uh, individual who is ordered and normally some kind of a company is seer also. 
So, the company is seen in the signature along with the order is a paper document which authenticates the fact that the entire document has been seen by the person who is signing and the signing person is responsible. Tomorrow, say later on, if the company reneges, in other words, they say, I never placed a purchase order, then you can take the company to court by producing this purchase order and say that they did send up an order and then I sent the material based on this order. So, it is very difficult for the company to uh, kind of say that I did not do that because there is a signature there. Okay. So, this has been used for a long time to authenticate documents. Signature is an authentication method. In fact, many important documents or contracts and so on, which may be multiple pages, every page is signed physically by somebody and even if corrections are made in the text and the corrections are made, there at the bottom they said so many corrections are made in this page and on the side where the corrections are made, this is a signature. So, signature, physical signature kind of authenticates a document and ties up the document to the person who actually created the document. So, in, a, in the electronic world, when some document comes, somebody can masquerade and send the document and you may be led to believe that came from some company, but it may have come by, it, it may have been a fit. So, there is need for authentication. So, there is an, a, there should be an equivalent of the physical signature in the electronic form and it is called digital signature. And digital signature must be such that just like a physical signature, the signature should be tied to the document. And the signature along with document has got to be authenticated and can stand up in a court of law for scrutiny. So, this is important. So, we will also talk about digital signature. Now, as I said that to insulate a company's local intranet from hackers and so on, you provide at the boundary of your intranet some device which uh, in some sense provides a protective wall between your internal network and the universal internet. This is called a fire firewall. So, it is deployed the boundary of the network. It could be either a hardware device or it could be some software running on a particular server. Depends upon the level of security you require and the amount of money you are willing to invest. It, it, the firewall's function is to link the organization's intranet to the internet and restrict the type of traffic that will pass in and out of the intranet to the intranet to the internet, thus providing security. Simplest firewalls when implemented in some routers, that is every company when the intranet at the boundary there will be a router which routes all the data which comes out of that intranet to appropriate IP addresses. So, this is a normally a router is a hardware device sold by some vendors and uh, some routers are called packet filtering type routers. So, they act as a firewall. They pass only some packets based on simple specified criteria as the type of access. Now, they, for instance, the router may allow only uh, uh, email, may not allow FTP, telnet and so on. Telnet allows an external, external user to log into a machine in your organization and that can be very, very dangerous. 
only trusted people are allowed to do telnet. Many organizations just do not allow telnet from outside the organization to the entire net of the organization. So, the router can actually be, be programmed to be to filter out some of the disallowed uh, facilities like it may disallow large files from going. So, FTP may be disallowed or it may disallow telnet. It may allow disallow emails to certain kinds of addresses and so on. It also sometimes the filters the, the, the something going out of the organization and something coming out of the into the organization. For instance, many colleges put a firewall or uh, primarily program the router you might say to disallow the students from looking at certain websites which are considered harmful, which are not considered useful for the students in the college. So, there may be some sites like gaming sites, music sites and other sites which uh, there is no student to have no business to access them because primarily they can access uh, information from the internet uh, which are appropriate for their curriculum and for their use, but not things like music files and uh, video clips and stuff like that. So, those websites which provide all these things and of course, some companies also ban electronic B 2 C commerce from inside the company. So, some B 2 C sites may be also banned. So, there is a filtering. So, the, um, uh, the webs cannot be actually certain web pages cannot be browsed. So, this that is based on the source and destination address. Also, in other words, some selectively in the company, some may be allowed who have high security clearance to be able to unrestrictedly go to say any website or they may be allowed to tell net outside or somebody like you know a top person who has got a secure machine may be allowed to tell net the company's machine when he is traveling. Okay. So, these are decisions which are taken at the highest level of the company and implemented. Okay. And uh, also you can program it that at certain times of the day certain types of traffic are disallowed okay. and certain times of the day the source traffics are allowed because it depends upon the busy time and the non busy time. <coughs> there is something called proxy application gateways and they are primarily for allowing members of an organization on a corporate internet to access internet facility ensuring organizational discipline and security. In other words, uh, you do not want to completely ban internet, but you still want to restrict the freedom of the of, uh, of use, use. So, there is something called a proxy machine. Proxy is something which uh, works on your behalf. So, proxy application programs running on the firewall machine. So, in other words, I said an, you know, instead of a router, it is actually a, a computer. On this machine, one which acts on behalf of all members of the organization wanting to use internet. In other words, it is some kind of a gatekeeper which uh, acts as a proxy or uh, something on your behalf as an intermediary between the internet and yourself. And similarly, when some traffic comes from the internet, that will decide whether it can be actually sent to the person to whom it is addressed or not. So, these issues are actually you might say it is a security or a, a watch, watchman standing at a gate who decides and then you know, the uh, who acts on your behalf. Like for instance, you may have a, a some, some people have security within the within a company. So, all types of unnecessary sales persons are not allowed inside the company and disturb the people working there. And only if there is a prior appointment, a person is allowed. Similarly, here also there is a certain 
In other words, the, that security person is acting on your behalf and filtering out the visitors who are coming and so on. This proc um, the proxy's main job, it monitors all requests, allows access only to designated addresses outside, limits use of certain browsers, and disallows use of some protocols with known security holes. In other words, it effectively is a gatekeeper, which uh, makes sure that uh, the people from inside the company do not have access, free access to anywhere. They also sometimes proxy applicant programs are run on the user's machine who are to, um, authorized to use the internet because the, if it is a gateway for a firewall, sometimes it may not allow at all internet access for a certain set of IP numbers. And only for certain IP numbers it may allow internet access. And in that case, they provide some kind of a proxy um, for the user's machine itself. Anyone from inside or outside an organization, given their user ID, password, service required, they all give it to the firewall. So they, once the firewall gets all this information, it acts as its proxy and decides what is to be done. It works on, on behalf of the user. It is actually, you might think of proxy as a server to the request is desktop PC. But it is a client to those requesting service. You know, and also it is, you know, in other words, uh, if a particular service is requested by a, uh, by a person in the company, he sends it to the, to the firewall server. But server itself is a client for a service which he tries to get. Okay, it is a kind of an intermediary, you might say. The firewalls need proxy agents for each service requested. So, in other words, they have a number of different, uh, you might say, domains or agents which do work on the behalf, like FTP, HTTP, Telnet, etc. As I said, you may ban some, you may allow some, depending on the IP address of the user. Um, proxy firewall is the initiator of all sessions and thus knows every activity. So, it is actually a big brother watching what is going on and ensure security. Um, fact, firewall the proxy function replaces the source address of transactions requester with its own IP address. Now, this is more very important because if the IP address of any of the people in the company gets known to the outsider, then he can use their IP address to get access to the machine. And to prevent that, the proxy essentially fil filters out that IP address and only presents with IP address because now it becomes the virtual client asking for the service. So, the external world only gets access to the IP address of the proxy and the proxy is the secure, secure system, secure gateway. It ensures that others on the internet see only firewalls IP address and all other IT ad IP addresses within the organization are hidden. So, the primarily there is a the firewall is something which kind of controls traffic you might say <coughs> and controls the type of traffic between the internet and the intranet and provides some kind of a you might say a, a security wall which be, which, be, which essentially um, this allows intrusion and um, this is uh, an important function, but the entire thing is normally some hardware on which some software is running. Apart from the firewall, there is also a need for some virus protection. Some companies put in the firewall computer itself also a a virus protection software which will filter out, which will take out every mail which is coming in to the company, do the virus analysis of that and anything with viruses it will just filter out and only send those which are no viruses inside. 
Some companies also try to do a virus carrying of mail going from inside the company to outside the company because that way your company will not get a bad name of uh, spreading a virus. And so, some virus scanning is also done uh, outgoing, outgoing information. There is one more important thing which is another piece of software which is called a spam filter. A lot of unnecessary mail comes to the organizations trying to sell things and so on which waste times of people, time of people because when they get you know 100 mail, <coughs> 90 of them may be spam or junk mail, only 10 may be useful to them. So, there are certain programs called spam filters. The spam filters effectively acts on behalf of all the users in within the internet <coughs> and tries to kind of filter out all known spammers you might say. And this is uh, another function, this strictly speaking virus protection and spam filtering are not part of the firewall, firewall function. Firewall primarily is a security enhancing device, but over and above that but a large server kind of large firewall can have software running on it, uh, which also does this, okay, over and above that. Or of course, depending upon uh, the company, you may put one more one more machine after the firewall to do this filtering business, okay. But it is it is up to up to the company's uh, information, uh, the, the person who organizes the computing facilities or the internet facilities. Now, apart from the hardware method like a firewall and software running on the firewall and so on, there is also a lot of software methods that are required and that is called encryption. And I um, will talk about encryption with what are known as secret keys. As data sent on a private network, Maybe a hack ha used by unauthorized persons, you need to be able to protect your messages by garbling that message. So, even if somebody gets hold of a message, because in the garbled form, it will difficult, be difficult for him to interpret it. In fact, coding of messages have a long history even during Roman times and times of our old uh, Rajas and Maharajas and so on, when messages are being sent from, uh, from say from, from the king to maybe somebody at the, at the battle front, it will not be written in plain, plain text. To read in plain text, if an enemy agent gets hold of it, then you will exactly know what was ordered uh, to the uh, front by the by the king. So, it is kind of encoded or garbled and it is garbled using some kind of a system called an encryption system. And how to decrypt that encrypted system is known only to the receiver and the receiver will be able to decrypt it knowing the encryption method. And that is been there is a very long history <coughs> of, en of encryption. So, in the new era of internet, there has of course taken a greater importance for electronic tra 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 traffic over the internet. The major difference of course is that all traffic over the internet is now digital. So, the encryption is all on zeros and ones or digital information. So, the encryption is just scrambling or gar making the garbling the text or digital te the, the text which is going. As you know, all text will be ASCII. ASCII will be sets of 8 bits per character. So, ultimately, they are a bit string. So, if, if the guy is garbled, even if 
one access it, it cannot understand what it contains. So, similarly, if you want to protect data stored in databases, which are accessible by internet, you should scramble it and store it. So, even if somebody gets hold of it, you will not be able to understand what is there in that disk. So, method of scrambling is known as encryption and method of unscrambling is known as de decryption. Okay, as I said, if the Raja sends some message to the to the person in the, in the to the general and the front, the he decrypts the encrypted uh, message which comes from the Raja to uh, to actually understand what the instructions are. There are certain types of terminology which is used when we talk about encryption and decryption. By plain text, we mean data in its natural form, like the ASCII, ASCII, ASCII form of a message. Encryption is taking data which is essentially a string of bits and transform it to another string of bits which cannot be understood. Because we are dealing with strings of bits and in digital world, where is textual information or audio information or video information, all of them ultimately become bit strings. The encryption method we are going to talk about is does not depend upon the type of data. It is applicable to multimedia data. Because the point, the reason why I am saying this is that many companies now try trying to sell music over the internet. So, they have encrypted that music and the person who has bought the music, he gets a decryption key to be able to decrypt that bit string and actually hear the music. Similarly, a lot of television programs are encrypted. So, unless you pay for listening to that channel and get a decryption key, you cannot actually view that view that particular television program. Even in satellite radio like the world space and so on, the radio broadcast is through satellite in a digital form. And um, <coughs> they encrypt this, this uh, program because their revenue, because they do not have any ad advertisements. So, the revenue is your subscription. So, those are some subscribers get a decryption key which is linked to the, the uh, particular radio set you have bought. The radio set will have a certain serial number and you will be given depending on the serial number of the <coughs> radio a decryption key. So, when the broadcast you have to set up the decryption key on your radio set, only if the decryption key is properly set, the music which comes on the from the satellite will, will be decrypted by your radio set to for you to enable uh, to hear music or news or whatever it is. So, most digital services now audio, video and so on which are pay by use you might say do use encryption. And so, the method of encryption and decryption is now does not depend upon the type of data. The transform data is encrypted data. So, you take plain text. When I say plain text does not really mean only textual data. It can be plain, plain text means audio, video or text or whatever it is. The transform data, when the plain text is, is encrypted and transformed, transform data is known as a cryptogram or a cipher text. A cipher text is the garbled form or the plain text. One very simple encryption method for a text, text I am giving an example is that suppose a plain text says this is a message x. One method of encryption, which essentially brings out the principle which is used in encryption, 
In fact, this principle is used also in some of the digital encryption methods which I am going to talk about is um, block the plain text that is you take say 5 characters at a time. So, this is a message you essentially essentially squeeze out all the blanks first of course, because blanks carry no information. So, squeeze out all the blanks and cut up the uh, text into blocks of 5 characters. The 5 is arbitrary, I could have cut up into 6 characters or 7 characters whatever it is. For illustrative purposes, <coughs> I am actually cutting it up into 5 characters. And then once you cut it up, then you apply a transformation called a permutation transformation. Permutation transformation, you see in this case is 4, 1, 2, 5, 3. It means that the fourth character becomes the first character here, the first character becomes the second character here and the second character becomes the third character here and fifth character to four becomes the fourth character and the third character namely becomes the fifth character. Because this permutation key is long five, five, five digits long and this says position 1 is now 4 <coughs> as a plain text, position 2 is 1, position 3 is 2, position 4 is 5, position 5 is 3. This is called a permutation. So, I permute. So, I take 5 characters, permute into this and similarly take this 5, permute and this take this 5 and permute. So, now I got a permutation. So, this is a permuted text and after doing the permutation, there is something called a substitution. That is take a character and replace it by uh, say replace A, you leave out B, C, D and take the fourth character. So, A is replaced by E and you can look at the alphabets as A to Z in a circular way. So, Z will get replaced by uh, if you leave out A, B, C, Z will be replaced by D. So, so if I take S, S will be replaced by S uh, T U V W, okay. T will be replaced by T U V W X that way. So you take the for fourth character from the existing character in the na natural A B C D sequence and get this cipher text. Now the cipher text, if you, if you see the cipher text and compare it with this original text, you can you can't make a head or tail out of this. Okay, it looks very very different from this. So this is a plain text, and this is the encrypted text or cipher text. Okay, this is an example of two permut two transformations. One is a permut permutation transformation followed by a substitution transformation. The keys are permutation function and the substitution function. So in order to decrypt it, I should know the both both of them and I should apply them in reverse. In other words, I am given the five cipher text. Now, what I do is W, if I know the key, now I will W, uh, re, uh, now replace W by S, okay, because uh, T U V W, so I go backwards, W uh, V U T S, okay. That is the way I go, backwards. So, this way I can, knowing this, I can go backwards and get this. And knowing this, I can go and back the, the permutation again on this and get back the original text, okay. So, that is the whole idea. There is encryption, <coughs> permutation and substitution and decryption if I know the keys is to do the reverse, okay. So, to make it uh, more um, you might say abstract, a plain text consists of m1, m2, m3 up to mn where each one is a block and cipher text is C1, C2, C3 up to Cn, where Ci is uh, the uh, permutation uh, which is Ti is permutation the ith character and K is a substitution, okay. Ci is the substitution and these two operators that is the keys which are applied to this, okay. Now to decrypt, I apply the same transformation reserve that I will point out. This method is called a symmetric 
key encryption. It is called symmetric because knowing the encryption key, I use that same encryption key at the receiving end and apply it in reverse to get back. Normally, the method of uh, encryption is is made public to the to the to a user. The sense that you will tell the user that I am going to use a permutation and a substitution. So that is known. But actually, the key, the permutation key and substitution key, are not made known. Because I, I can see that you can you can see the permutation key can be randomized. I give many many permutation keys. Similarly, substitution can be four characters away or five characters away or uh, one two characters away. Anything, anything. All right. It, it is arbitrary. So both of them are being arbitrary. Unless the person knows the actual key used, even though he knows its permutation and substitution. He will not be able to get the uh, the the actual uh, plain text from the um, correct text. The main problem is the following: See, there is if you do a cipher or a crypt, uh, you know you do a there are two you might say you might say there are two groups of people. One group of people invent these types of methods of uh, of garbling messages. That is, uh, they come up with this um, encryption methods and uh, they try to make the encryption method as difficult to break as one can. There is something called a strength of encryption. The greater the strength, more difficult it is to break. And there are a whole lot of other people who try to get samples of transmitted data and using those samples try to guess what what is used. After all you know it is permutation and, and substitution. So if you get a whole lot of samples of text, what you could do is you can use a computer to try all permutations, try all substitutions and you may, you may hit uh, one particular one where the decrypted ciphertext decrypted may make sense to you. In other words, it is actually English, okay, uh, as per the understandable English language, okay. So, then now you say that I have been able to de decrypt. So, the prerequisite of being able to break codes that got get a huge sample set of. Uh, and en uh, encrypted data flowing and using this large sample you try using computer to try out in a brute force fashion all method all, all of the keys and try to guess the right key. Of course the only way to beat it is that for every message I send I use a different key. But that is not always practical, okay. And I can randomize the keys. But then the problem is one of distributing the keys. The other person should be told, and the key should be sent to him in some kind of a um, secure way. Same internet cannot be used for sending the key, okay. Secrecy of key is to be ensured. And um, if the key is to be sent to many partners, and we use the same key for every partner, then of course it is no more secret because everybody knows that this is the key you are using. So for every business partner you have, you must use a different key. And that is a that becomes a horrendous thing. You must have a directory of all the different keys and to whom you are using which key. And similarly, the receiver must have a directory saying that if I, if I talk to A, I must have this key, if I talk to B, I have to have this key and so on and go through the entire directory. And the key distribution problem, 
of distributing the key to all the people and periodically changing the keys becomes a very difficult bookkeeping problem. So the problem with symmetric encryption is this. So key distribution is very difficult. Advantage of course is symmetric is easy and fast to transform plain text to cipher text. Because we use a pr permutation and also substitution, it is very easy to implement. And so there is a advantage of symmetric encryption. Now, symmetric encryption in spite of this little problem which I pointed out has been very popular. And of course, there are methods which are kind of there to alleviate the key distribution problem and uh, try to eliminate the key distribution problem in some sense, okay, at least in, in the sense of uh, kind of uh, being able to uh, hide the key also in some way, all right. So this I will talk about later, but we look at the methods which have been used in practice and in fact encryption was people started using very early in the uh, computer era. In 1975, IBM suggested a protocol, suggested a method of encryption called digital encryption standard and which was accepted by the US government and started in 1977. It was reasonably secure. What I mean, what is meant by reasonably secure is that uh, if, if suppose somebody gets hold of some samples of the and cipher text, to be able to guess the actual keys from that sample by brute force method using a computer is actually practically impossible in those days. In 77 when computer was slow, one would ca calculate that if you use brute force, it would take a few years to decrypt, the uh, find out the key and decrypt. But now as computers have become faster and faster, it turns out the earlier method which is used, which I am going to describe is no more secure because machines are so fast that brute, brute force will allow you to um, guess the keys in reasonable time. When I mean reasonable time means 2-3 days using a very high speed computer in 2-3 days <coughs> I can find out the key. That means it is just not secure. So now this has been you might say replaced or um, is there a successor to this it's been replaced by new methods but the new methods still try to use the advantages which this had. The greatest advantage which this had was that it was a simple digital method which could be implemented using a chip. In other words, you can actually design an LSI chip or VSI chip to be able to do the encryption and decryption. So you need not, you need a, you don't need a program because programs take notoriously long time whereas chips and hardware will take much shorter time. So that is the advantage of DES. And so as I said, DES has been retained in some sense, but DES has been modified. And DES has been modified to make it easy to again use a VLSI device to be able to do the encryption and decryption. In the original desk, a message <coughs> is broken up into 64 bit blocks and each block is separately encrypted. Just like I showed an example of 5 characters blocking and on each 5 characters you applied a permutation and substitution. This 
divides up into blocks of 16, 64, 64 bits and it applies permutation and substitution in my again same type of an idea on this uh, set of um, 64 bits. In fact, the simplest kind of a method which is used or the major idea used in this is to take the plain text. I am not using 64 bits because it becomes too long on the on the screen, but I use the uh, 8 bits, you know, byte. And then if I take byte by, by cut, cut up into bytes, then there is a key which is a, again a string of bits and the 8 bits there are so many possible permutations of 8 bits, okay. So, 2 to the 8 possibilities are there, which is fairly large number. And I do um, the encryption, cuts. one simple encryption can be just exclusively varying these two. And decryption is to take the encrypted text and exclusively var. So, the simplicity of the, the exclusively var transformation is so simple that the same transformation applied in reverse it gets you, gets you back the original function as you can see from here. But of course, this is not what is used, I mean, this is just to illustrate, okay. Um, the, uh, in the, it comes up a number of steps, okay. As I said, it is split into 64 bit blocks, apply an initial permutation on a block. So, the result is uh, a new block is initially, I, I p is an initial permutation function on p where p is 64 bits and b is the result. Split b into two 32 bit blocks into left 32 bits and right 32 bits, pick a 56 bit key, permute it. Left circular shift by 1 giving a key k i and perform a complex sequence of operations to apply and obtain another uh, uh, you know function of uh, R1 and K1 and find the uh, find R2 and R2. I mean, this these steps are given, but more it's easier to explain the whole thing, uh, giving a uh, uh, giving this picture. Okay, uh, picture really is extremely easy to see what is going on. Okay, so there is a 64 bit plain plain text, and there is initial permutation. Initial permutation it becomes again 64 bits and there is a 56, 56, 56 kit, uh, bit key and the key is le left, cir left circular shifted and then permuted and after permutation you get a, a key here k1 and some bits are dropped okay because it is 56 bit key and then you drop some bits here and then after this you brought, drop some bits here and bring it to uh, actually if I want to apply on this 32 bits this must be a function which operates on 2 32 bits, okay. And so, this operates on 2 32 bits and uh, left is taken and the function of k1 r1 is extremely hard to get r2, okay. And this is again take r1 is taken directly and becomes r l2 and this continues like that, okay. And I will come back to this next time because I am running out of time and explain to you, you can see here that the same operation is repeated again and again. It is actually repeated 16 times in this case. And the newer does is, does the repetition is more, the key is longer and so on to kind of improve the security of the system, okay. But the general idea remains the same. And so next time what I will do is, I will take this, start from this picture and explain this in slightly greater detail. Uh, what essentially does does, okay. So, um, we will continue from this point uh, next time.